Hello, everybody. And thank you for joining me here for this panel. I'm extremely excited. And actually, we had some last minute change. So Paul over there, he took the, the, the leap of faith to join us last minute. Hopefully, he's going to catch his flight after. Yeah, it's OK. I can miss a flight. No, I but, can't. Um, we're here to talk about China, Southeast Asia, investments, and all of these things. And actually, Paul has lived, or he lived in China before, and you worked with Apple, right? So you have relevant experience there. Yeah, I, I, I spent 10 years uh, in China either opening up retail stores or actually even doing some startup investment in the tail end of my time. So. Awesome. So you're going to definitely tell us something about that. Um, Lou, you already spoke today, so I don't know if it makes sense to introduce you again, but maybe just like very, very quickly, just tell everybody what you do and maybe put it in a way that hasn't been done before, you know? Just tell them something new. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm back. I was uh, literally in the panel like two hours ago because I think I'm flying all the way from Silicon Valley to here. I'm happy to make the most of my time in the slash Singapore. And uh, yes, I mainly invest in Silicon Valley tech and healthcare in the in the United States, but I was born and raised in China, actually in the Mongolia. So it's not a very typical place you heard from. Uh, your Chinese friend and uh, <laughs> so I do uh, sometimes spend time in Chinese market although I'm investing in US but I always talk with my founder there saying that for nowadays you have to think about globalization you have to have global perspective from day one because your biggest competitor may outside United States your biggest market might yeah. be in Southeast Asia yeah well and last but not least Grace who is actually from China, now lives in Singapore and works for Jungle Ventures. So can you just introduce briefly what you do here in Singapore right now? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Grace uh, from Jungle Ventures. Uh, we're based in Singapore, investing in startups in Southeast Asia and India. Uh, we're mainly investing in, in Series A and Series B in both consumer tech and enterprise tech. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I have a couple of questions here, but uh, we have Slido as well. So if you have any questions in the audience, please shoot them over and I will read them. I will pick some of them. Uh, Paul, let's get it started. So tell us a little bit more about your recent investment that is connected to Southeast Asia, China, and why did you make that investment? Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, th this is a tricky part because uh, I, I invest on behalf of Siam Commercial Bank. So I manage the corporate uh, venture fund. Uh, I myself am not responsible for China. And actually, uh, th that's not to say that SCB doesn't have China interests. We actually do have a strategic investment team that okay. was formed specifically to invest in China. Uh, it's just that I don't have direct experience in my capacity as a, a bank CVC. Yeah. I've, I've done investments. But that said, uh, there is certainly a lot of interest in what's going on between China and Southeast Asia. I mean, there's always been a lot of economic flow between the two regions, but what we're seeing as of late is uh, literally a, a battle of titans. You know, you, you've got yeah. Alibaba and Tencent and JD uh, and Baidu, and they're running all around Southeast Asia, Thailand in particular, uh, and they're partnering up with local companies. Yes. And you know, you know, battle battle lines are being drawn. So I, I think Southeast Asia is going to be a very very interesting cage match between you know Chinese tech giants, Southeast Asian yeah. emerging giants. Uh, it's it's going to be a bit of a chaotic party. Yeah, I'm actually excited to see what's going to happen. But Lou, um, so tell us uh, because you said that you invest in Silicon Valley. You, uh, in the backstage, you told me that you didn't invest in China or Southeast Asia yet. But how do you perceive those markets from your perspective? Like Silicon Valley-based investor that has roots in China or in this region. So how do you perceive, perceive these markets and how, do you have a plan for them? As I mentioned, like, as I mentioned earlier on that, uh, I was telling founder that they have to have global perspective. As an investor, even based in Silicon Valley, we have to have global perspective as well. For example, I recently I invested a company doing the artificial intelligence solution for supply chain automation. And when we talk about supply chain, it's always global supply chain. And even if it's a US-based American founder, they have to also think about how to navigate between uh, partners in Southeast Asia, partner in China, and be able to build out their interest here. And meanwhile, on the other side, when we are talking about new opportunity for the new technology application, 
yes, U.S. is a big market, but the growing power is in the emerging market like China and Southeast Asia. Got it. Actually, yeah, if I yeah. could just comment, you know, I, I think what's what's really interesting is it's it's actually less about investment dollars flowing into China, mm -hmm. because you know these Chinese tech companies are growing so fast. And their scale is so large that it's actually, you know, just to get into China, you have to write very, very large check sizes. Yeah. And the valuations are getting very yes. rich. Yes. Whereas I think now the Chinese funds are flush with cash and they're getting very aggressive in hunting around Silicon Valley, yeah. Israel, Southeast Asia for investments. So I think we're going to see a lot of investment dollars flow out of China into yeah. the rest of the world. No, absolutely. And maybe, Grace, you can build on that. So uh, what... What Paul just has said is that we have all of these big players, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, kind of shopping around Southeast Asia. So do you have a strategy or do you tell your startups that you invest in Southeast Asia, hey, get ready for these guys to come. They're going to acquire you. They're going to invest. You're going to scale to China because of them. Is that part of your strategy? Yeah, so I mean, uh, with those you know, capitals coming from China to Southeast Asia, especially from those union cores in China, yeah. Uh, you know, when we talk to our startups, we always, you know, you know, ask them to consider what will be your value proposition in the market going forward. Given that if you know Tencent, Alibaba is going to invest uh, in the major platform here, how are you going to compete with them? I think for a startup, a good way to think about that is, um, you know, you don't want to compete with. You, know, you don't want to create another Facebook to compete with Facebook. You probably want to you know, create a new game to compete with Facebook. You want to do an Instagram or WhatsApp. So think very carefully what will be your market value proposition, knowing that those giants are coming to your, your home country. And so do you actually actively prepare those companies and tell them like, hey, they're actually going to come or they're already here. And this is your strategy that you should shoot for, that you should actually sell to Baidu, Alibaba and these companies. Um, I think there are two group of companies. One is they may already doing very similar things before you know the, the Chinese money coming in. So for that kind of companies, I think the good strategy for them is you know how can they quickly get to a bigger scale? Because uh, we see that the, the you know international investors when they come to this region, they realize the complexity of operations. So they tend to invest in someone who already been operating here, has a decent size of customers. You know, then those yeah. kind of startup will become a ideal investment target or even acquisition target. Or if startups are not doing things that directly compete, then what they need to think is how can they build their products complementary yeah. um, to you know, the international giant. Absolutely. Well, Paul and Lou, I want you to spend some time on AI because that's a big topic globally, but also a big topic in China. Uh, and uh, you, Paul, told me that you invest or you look at AI investments. And Lou, you too, you just recently invested or one of your portfolio companies is AI company. So uh, how do you see like China and this like, you know, the data war and all of these things influencing Southeast Asia and the rest of the world, you know, in terms of AI and like the next you know, the, the internet, uh, whatever, 4.0 or 5.0 or whatever is coming? Well, so I, I, I operate under the, the thesis that um, China is going to be the dominant power to chase in AI. Because it's, you know, it, AI basically is two components. It's the development of the algorithms, and it's basically the accumulation and feeding of massive amounts yeah. of data. Now, there is phenomenal talent in development all over the world. But nowhere in the world can you get as much data uh, in China. And, and for better or for worse, because of uh, you know, the, the, the rather strong arm of the government, there are, they, can, they, they can accumulate data. Companies can accumulate yes. data uh, without considering some of the concerns that might impact or affect Western countries. So th just by their nature, Chinese companies, Chinese government, they have vast amounts of data. And they are incredibly creative in the application of that data. You know, not just for a few narrow uh, use cases, but across the board, uh, whether it's for finance, education, health, uh, credit scoring, yeah. you know, the Sesame credit score, you know, across the board, they're insanely creative. So um, I think that makes it a very, very challenging Oh, I guess in the startup world, they, they've got a very unfair competitive <laughs> advantage. I'm sorry, I'm spitting. Uh, an unfair <laughs> advantage to overcome. Uh, so, you know, the, the question that sort of bedevils me and probably any other investor is, you know, what opportunities are there uh, 
more on the development side? Because again, I just don't see any tech hub country catching up to the volume of data that the Chinese have. Tell me real quick, does something similar happen in Thailand, let's say, as well, in terms of the government getting involved and protecting the data and trying to like, you know, replicate what Chinese government is doing? Probably the short answer is not as much. Okay. I think we're still thinking through how do we deal with privacy, how do we deal with data ownership. Uh, you know, and these are this is not just a Thai thing. This is this is an issue that you know that plagues you know all governments. Like, how do you deal with privacy? How do you deal with data ownership? Who owns what? How do yeah. you transfer data? How do you secure data? Uh, you know, I I think. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier in China just because they've spent more time thinking about it. You know, they, they make it a of priority course. in terms of policy thinking. It is true, yeah. So they're just, they just have a phenomenal head start. Yeah, and, and Lou, I, I want you to maybe build up on this. So you're in Silicon Valley. China definitely wants to become a dominant player, maybe already is, when it comes to AI tech. Um, many people in my circles kind of like wish for US and China collaborating on these things and not really just competing head to head but it, you know it's not really happening these days what do you what do you see is it going to happen at some point that there is going to be more collaboration in terms of tech and AI or there's actually going to be more nationalism that everybody is going to be trying to just protect themselves their data and access and talent and everything I feel there are lots of uh, collaboration happened before for the AI because when we check on the AI research paper may actually f more than 50% of uh, our, uh, the public uh, research paper are written by either Chinese or Chinese yes. Americans. So that's the reason like there's lots of collaboration between China, US, even like for Google, the Google AI Center is actually based in China and it's a global center because they want to take advantage of the application use case and also the data amount in China. But meanwhile, on the other side, I have to say that Silicon Valley still have a strong advantages in terms of uh, AI research, AI algorithm, even yeah. application. Because I know AI is a buzzword. We joke about it like six years ago. Every <laughs> company is a big data company. And nowadays, every company is an AI company. Yes. But the AI application has to go through different stage. Like for us, I mainly invest in B2B. I believe that AI application could show like even bigger our full capability in the industry application and then maybe B2C because like individual, like a uh, end user is hard to really uh, using the current technology to really satisfy everyone's need. For example, I use lots of this personal assistant, AI assistant. Yeah. None of them really work for me. Yeah. But I invest lots of companies doing the AI in healthcare. For example, computer vision for medical imaging, deep learning for medical imaging, robotics for surgery robot. They're doing great. They are actually not replacing doctor or nurse. Okay. They're trying to assist the doctor yes. or nurse to increase their efficiency. Yes. So that's what I saw the advantages of Silicon Valley and the US. But on the other side, like uh, Paul just mentioned, China has huge advantage for data amount. But the challenge part is the quality of the data. People, we always okay. talk about, okay, big data, big data, but not only just big data important matters. Yes. The quality of data also matters. And for China, he has the big data for sure, but the whether there's high quality data is still a question mark. On the other thing, another thing is especially for industry application, we need to label the data. And uh, the digitalization of the data in China is not done yet, done, done well yet, but it's growing pretty fast. So I think that's the pro and cons yeah. for China to develop AI technology, but also that's the opportunity for two sides to work together. For sure, as a Chinese investing USA <laughs> company, I want two sides to work together, but yeah. I also understand why now like every, like the company are very sensitive about it and also government so is very sensitive about it because the key point is when we're talking about AI, we also seeing the big challenge not only for startups but also potential threat for the whole society is the monopoly of data. Yes. Big tech comp company is controlling most of the data no matter your social data, your working yeah. data or even your healthcare data. And so real quick, just to answer my question at the beginning. So in the short term, are we going to see more competition or collaboration? I think more competition. Got it. Um, more competition because each side is worried about who's going to be the owner of the yes, data. Yes. So they have to protect for self. I tend to agree. Um, Grace, uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Well, we have a lot of questions here on Slido. I don't know if you can put it up. I don't know how this works. But I think this is a good question for you, Grace. So how much is capital control an issue for Chinese funds going global or Southeast Asia? 
Yeah, it's, I, think, I think he is asking or that person is asking that uh, many people talk about like Chinese money going global, but also there is a lot of regulatory issues. The Chinese government is trying to limit how much money is actually going to get out of China. So uh, is this kind of like these controls, like how, how much do they affect how much capital is actually coming here to Southeast Asia? Do you experience something? Let's say, you know, do you have LPs from China coming to Southeast Asia and stuff like that? What do you see? What are the trends? Uh, we haven't seen any impact from that. Okay. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know exactly what's the policy now in China market, so I can't really comment on that. Okay. But you know, as an investor operating in Southeast Asia, we have not seen any changes in the past 10, 12 months. Okay. I, I, I'd probably say from the Chinese government perspective, you know, I, I don't think they put in rules uh, just for the sake of having rules. I, th I think everything that the Chinese government does, there's a very strategic, rational reason behind it. So I think if they're, they're capital controls, it's because they don't want to see hot money flowing in and out of the country. But if they see that investments are made, particularly strategic investments yes. in mission critical technologies, yes. I don't think the Chinese government is going to step in the way of that. So if it's basically acquiring key enabling technologies in places like Silicon Valley in I Israel, agree. they're going to be more than happy to push capital out. Absolutely. Like what I see around me, like, you know, you definitely need to get approval if you want to invest a lot of money out of, uh, outside of China, if you're a Chinese investor, if you're a Chinese fund. But also like what you, what you just said, we have seen a lot of companies investing a lot outside and then it led to problems. And that's why the government stepped in and said, like, no, you cannot do this. But, you know, but, but as a reaction, a lot of times, you know, what we're seeing now is the Chinese government is reaching out to companies like Google and say, look, instead of us instead of having money flow into your markets, why don't you set up a lab? Why don't you work with our universities? Set up in China. Yes. Train our own people. So if you're worried about you know, immigration, whatever, you know, I mean, it, it actually takes care of a lot of the issues on both sides. So if the US is worried about all this immigration, then you just set up a lab. Yeah. You, know, you, get, you get these universities to collaborate with Stanford or you know, um, you know, University of Tel Aviv, and, and they just operate in these different countries. Yeah. There's ways around it. Cool. Um, another question here, because like this panel is is titled Belt and Road Project, so let's 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 dive into it a little bit more. So uh, somebody's asking, do you feel that China's Belt and Road Project will radically change the global economy? Paul, tell me, like, what about Thailand? Is it is is Thailand part of this project uh, or Southeast it, Asia? It, is it? It is, it really is part? but I, I I'm probably, I, admittedly, I I know very very little about the details <laughs> of Belt and Road. It's it's one of those. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about it, and I know it's been around for a while. Admittedly, I'm horrible at the details, but you know, um, but I I do think it is. You know, so I, I'm, I'm not trying to be too cynical and I'm trying to be very balanced about it, but I think the Chinese are very, very good at, uh, they become very good at extending their soft power yeah. globally. Uh, you know, before I think it was a lot of hard power, but I think they've realized that, um, you know, extending the economics. So, I mean, if you, look at, if you look at what China has done in places like Africa, you know, extending loans, building out infrastructure. It's given them access to critical resources, physical resources, rare earth metals and whatnot. I think, uh, you know, Belt and Road is just an extension of that broader economic soft power policy to basically create ties across the region in a way that, uh, you know, I think a lot of the Western powers have ceded you know, their influence yeah. to this part of the world. And I think the Chinese are smart enough to sort of come in and fill in that vacuum. So, so let's take it from a different angle because, uh, so this like One Belt, One Road initiative, it definitely involves like Chinese investing a lot of money elsewhere in the, in the region. And so, Grace, for you, uh, how is the money from China perceived in Southeast Asia in general? Like we talked about it briefly because you have the strategy like, yeah, hey, get acquired by Tencent, Alibaba and this, but, but the general mindset, like, like do people welcome this? or they're against it? Like, what is the general mindset in Southeast Asia? I think so far, um, people s see the money in a very positive way. Okay. Uh, you know, based on the startups we have talked to so far, I think most of the entrepreneurs, when they look at China money, they don't look at it just as a capital. And more importantly, it's the market know-how those yes. Chinese investors can bring in. And I think when the startups 
they're you know scaling up from Series B to Series B. Those knowledge are very critical. Yes. Um, you know, so in that sense, I think it's very positive uh, for this this market in, in general. Okay. Um, I want to spend some time on, you know, talking to people that are not from Asia, let's say, and they're looking into Asia. They're looking into China, and uh, you know. I've heard many times and like it's in the circles that like China matters, Asia matters. You should be spending time understanding these markets. Um, so, you know, maybe again, Paul and Lou, let's start with you. Like, why do you think that Asia matters and why companies from United States or from Europe that are not maybe thinking about it yet should actually do that? Um, I, I think it's just by virtue of scale. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you know, when one of seven people around the world, like if any, anyone, that, anyone that wants to build a viral startup yeah. and look at a global marketplace cannot ignore that, you know, if, if your total addressable market is, you know, eight or nine billion, um, and 12% of that are Chinese, it's, it's stupid to ignore a huge market segment. And it's not, it, you know, you're talking about the 12% that is, probably one of the, they're, they're accumulating wealth at an incredibly fast pace. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, okay, we're going to ignore the 12% at the bottom of the pyramid. You know, these are very wealthy, increasingly yes. wealthy customer yes. base, very tech savvy. So you can't ignore it. Uh, and then it's not even just money going into consumers, but the amount of investment that's coming out. Yeah. So a lot of the technology that's being generated. So it's like we, we sit there and we say, okay, you know, what happens when we digitize, uh, you know, the financial industry? You know, I mean, I, I look at countries like the UK and the US and, you know, the, the, the whole idea of digitizing money, cash, you know, what percentage of the country is cashless? You know, I think it's still, you know, 90, 95, 97% of, of transactions are yeah. still largely based on credit cards and yep. cash and not any sort of digital money. And you look at China and the number is easily yeah. 10 to 15 X. Yes. So if you ask what markets are going to drive consumer behavior and tech in consumer behavior, uh, you have to look at China. You know, even if you don't care about the Chinese product, even if you don't care about the consumer, if you wanna see how society could react to new technology and how it impacts yeah. your society, you have to study China. Yeah. And so, Lou, I, I want you to build on that. But uh, maybe from the perspective, because your investments are in Silicon Valley, but you, because you understand China, you know what's going on, do you actually tell your companies, hey, you should watch this company in China, how they're doing, and you should study it, and you should maybe adapt certain things to your business model? Do you do, you do that? Or, or how, do you, how do you approach this like China matters, Asia matters thing? Uh, I don't really do that, but uh, the thing is, I want to really help the founder to have this global perspective to yep. understand like what's going on there. Whether you may have your biggest uh, potential competitor, or maybe you need to think about the new application of your technology, and in this new market. And when back to the question about why Asia matter is not only the size market size is big, it's also about the growth potential. Like very simple, uh, like for example, U.S. is a big market for sure, yes. and. Uh, for example, healthcare industry in general, country that's 20% of US GDP. That's huge, that's attractive as well. But in China, healthcare industry only counts for 5% of GDP. Yes, it's not as big as US, but meanwhile means tons of potential. And when this market has potential, means the opportunity for new startups. You know, when there's a big market, but there's already existing player dominate the market, it's much harder for a startup to really grow there, be disruptive and become the new player. But if there's a potential, there's an opportunity to new player to send you out. That's also the reason for startup companies. For sure, it is a good environment for them to grow their business in Silicon Valley and also United States. Maybe build up to a business with a $100 million revenue. But after that, they may have bottleneck for the revenue flow. And they could think yeah. about emerging market like Southeast Asia or China to quickly grow to bigger stage and beat up their biggest uh, competitor in the market. Not only startup, but even for a big tech company in the Valley, they're thinking about the collaboration as well. Okay. For example, recently there's a deal between JD and Google. Yeah. They're gonna they partnership together. Google yeah. used JD to penetrate into Southeast Asia and China, and JD used Google to penetrate into United States. Yes. 
great. And and so, so yeah, Grace. Uh, yeah. So um, you know, as an investor operating in Southeast Asia, we're very bullish about this part of the world. Yeah. You know, Southeast Asia is one of the largest growing economy in the world, and you know, you, you see this market is actually very massive. Um, across many different countries. Um, you know, on one hand, you have four million new internet users every month in this okay. region. On the other hand, you have metro cities that G GDP per capita is actually considered as a developed or developing country. So I think, you know, this dynamic created multi-layers, very sustainable opportunities for both startups and investors in the region. Can you maybe spend a little bit more time on the thesis that your fund has? Because I, I checked your website and I think it's really interesting because, you know, Lou may, may mentioned that like emerging uh, markets, you know, like Southeast Asia. But how you look at, you know, you look at top tier cities in Southeast Asia, you look at them like developed economies or developed markets, those those cities that have a lot of people, that have a lot of money or it's middle class. Can you, can you spend a little bit more time on that? How you actually, what your thesis is? And uh, you know how you are looking for those those companies that are kind of addressing these these sure. these markets. So from consumer business perspective, the way we look at the market is not by countries, yeah. but by uh, customer segmentation. So we look at all the metro cities, you know, places like Bangkok, Jakarta, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh City, KL. We see, you know divided consumer by other income levels. Yeah. Uh, so we see that in, you know, if we divide it cons consumer in that level, each layer actually have very similar user behaviors. Yes. And that way, w on surface, the market is fragmented. But when you divide the users like that, it's actually a very massive market in every single layers. And then we think about what are the opportunities you know, to serve each layer of consumers. Um, from enterprise uh, perspective, we think there's a lot of opportunities in serving small, medium business. We see there's a big trend of uh, digitalization happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, every country you look at here, every country, 60% of GDP actually generated by small, medium business. And the majority of those businesses are now moving from traditional to digital. Um, you know, we make several investments in the space where the companies actually create the softwares, um, technology backbones to empower those small medium business. And we see tremendous opportunities in those sectors. Great. Uh, we have two minutes left. So uh, maybe let's spend some time on, you know, we hear this all the time, these bubbles, right? And valuations going through the roof. So, you know, from your perspective, China, Southeast Asia, are we in the bubble right now? What are we going to see in the next... Uh, you know, a couple of years, let's say, you know, Paul, how do you, how do you see this? Uh... Well, I, I, I think on average, globally, prices are a little bit frothy. There's just been a lot of VC money raised lately, a lot of activity. You know, you can't have three, four years of explosive growth without yeah. the need for, I don't, you know, I don't want to say, I, I, I personally use the word bubble a lot, but it actually isn't so much a bubble because a bubble pops, but I think there needs to be kind of a recalibration. That's my very polite way of okay. saying some adjustments. Because I think there's still a lot of, there's a lot of room to grow uh, fundamentally, but I think pricing needs to be aligned with that growth. So do you think we're going to see some devaluations over the course of next couple of months? Or And I don't want you to do predictions, but it's just like no, no, kind no, of I, like I, general. I think at the very least, I, I don't think we're going to see a, you know, a massive correction, but I think there's going to be a leveling off as, you know, the the fundamentals, you know, as the reality catches up with the fantasy. Yeah. Lou, real quick. Yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, when people talk about Silicon Valley, I always think that we have a bubble there for valuation. <laughs> and I also joke about it. We have a bubble, bubble economic in the valley. But the good thing is we have bubble under control. Like you said, we don't really have bubble burst. We have a deep flat. So we were able to, with the power of uh, investor and also founder, to create a very healthy ecosystem. And when I compare Chinese market, Southeast Asian market, and also Silicon Valley, I think we're at value, all valuation is much, much lower. <laughs> and here the valuation is crazy high. So okay. I have to say, for sure, there's a bubble valuation okay. in the Southeast Asia, in China. And uh, it has to be changed. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a big problem. And either, hopefully, it will be deep flat. But if bubble burst, I don't know what's going to okay. happen for the capital in the region. Hopefully, with the professional investor and also entrepreneur, people could reach the agreement to yeah. deflate valuation and to have a healthy. We're running outcome. out of time, so Grace, just last comment on this on the bubble in Southeast Asia. So let's just pray the bubble will not burst <laughs> anytime soon. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We are right on time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.